This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is James Mattis, who is an Annenberg Fellow at the Hoover Institution and a retired United States Marine Corps General who last served as the 11th Commander of U.S. Central Command. He is on the Berkeley campus this week as the Chester Nimitz Memorial Professor. General Mattis, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Where were you born and raised? I was born up in the Pacific Northwest, and I was raised on the banks of the Columbia River uh, in a uh, little town up there that had a combination of agricultural pursuits and nuclear industry. So it was a kind of a tale of two cities. And, and looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking of the, about the world? Uh, they had enormous impact on me. They had both uh, traveled around the world. Uh, my father had been a merchant mariner. Uh, my mother had served overseas in South Africa uh, with Army intelligence in World War II. And they introduced us to a world full of great ideas and not a fearful place, but a place to go enjoy. And probably the most important thing was uh, they never bought a television, but we had a great big library. And so the ideas that were there, uh, we were encouraged to explore, and, uh, and it shaped my view of learning. And, and is that when you uh, became uh, uh, a lifetime learner and a reader of books, in addition to being later a warrior? Uh, it certainly had a big impact. I think I was uh, pretty focused on things I enjoyed, like geology, the American West, cowboys, Indians, that sort of thing. Uh, but eventually, when I got into a profession, then certainly I knew where I could go for good ideas. Where were you educated? In, in Washington? Yeah, uh, public schools growing up. I went to Central Washington State uh, College for a little over three years, and then I went off into the Marines. And when did you decide uh, to become a professional soldier? Was that an inevitable result of your background? No, uh, I'd been interested in the Marines since a young age. My older brother was in Vietnam when I enlisted uh, into the reserves, uh, the officer candidate course in particular. And I don't think I had the intention of making it a career at that point. I wasn't closed-minded about it, but it was to go in and, uh, and do my time. In those days, we had the draft. There was little choice. Uh, and then look around, see what else was out there. I like to ask my guests about the skills and temperament involved in, in your profession. So the first thing I want to ask you along that line of questioning is, wh what do you see as the skill set and temperament that, that are really important for a Marine? Underneath its rather Prussian uh, exterior, uh, we expect people who are very curious. Uh, they have got to have a curiosity about life that will carry them beyond uh, any kind of institutional learning. Uh, the Marines enjoy having people who are somewhat mavericks, frankly. Uh, they protect them, <clears throat> and they find many times that that sort of independent thinking is a big help to our core and its mission, which has been heavily into the small wars and the minor interventions. Well, we can always fight the bigger wars, but you have to be ready to fight in any climb or place. And in that regard, uh, there's nothing new really under the sun. You can always find a history book somewhere that can guide you. So there's a strong bent towards intellectual rigor and a historical appreciation of where we're at today. Uh, obviously, uh, physical fitness, uh, Marine officers are expected to be at the top of their game. And then there's another aspect, whether you call it spiritual or emotional or psychological, where you actually see your attitude as a weapon 
uh, when you go into tough times and that transmits down through your ranks. So it's a combination of the mental, of the physical, and the spiritual, or as Confucius would put it, body, mind, and spirit. One of the themes that I identified in your career as, as a general and as a soldier is learning, a real commitment mm -hmm. to, to learning through time. So what you know today may not be the most useful thing in your new situation. Talk a little about that because you're suggesting that your soldiers have to have that also. Uh, yes, uh, I joined the Marine Corps where the Commandant of the Marine Corps has his own reading list. <clears throat> and all Marines at the rank of private will read these three or four books. Plus there's a couple other additional ones if they're interested. Every corporal reads a different set. Sergeants a different, lieutenants, majors, generals have their own reading list when they make general. They're not allowed just to fall back on what they already know. They have to read a, a different set of books. So as a Marine Corps that in a very accountable way, very abrupt way, frankly, uh, I've, I've been under commanders and executive officers who, if you didn't do your reading, you spent the weekend reading the book and reporting to them on Monday morning. So there was a, a, an institutional expectation that you would continue to learn. Uh, and frankly, uh, over many, many years, uh, I can, for the younger officers who might view this lecture, tell them how they can become four-star generals. They can fight enemies who are dumber than a bucket full of rocks. <laughs> and those are generally enemies who have not had the same rigor in pressing themselves to learn from history and to be curious about the world around them. So as a Marine Corps that had that expectation, and the Marine Corps rewarded you uh, institutionally with promotion, with certain plum assignments, if you did that kind of reading. You, in, in one of your talks that I heard, you, you emphasized the, the, the qualities of humanity. In other words, the, you say it at one point, you know, it, it's good to have a sense of humor as a Marine. Mm -hmm. Talk a little about that because it, it's not what we <clears throat> normally think of. Obviously, there has to be a sense of purpose, yeah. but, 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 but uh, that, that keeping in touch with your humanity is important. Well, I'm here on this campus for the Nimitz lecture series, and I would just tell you in studying him in preparation for this, it was very clear that as difficult as his task was to take over the war in the Pacific with the Pacific fleet on the bottom of Pearl Harbor, pretty much, uh, he never lost sight of the fact there were human beings on both sides of that war. Uh, he did his duty. He, he dealt very strong blows against the Imperial Japanese Navy and Army but he never forgot there were human beings on both sides. And the, the task is so grim, and I'm a Marine infantry officer, we're people who close with and destroy the enemy in what we can call intimate killing. Uh, you cannot go into something like that and not be changed. So at times a sense of humor is almost like <clears throat> body armor around your body. This is armor around your spirit as you keep your spirit from going so grim with some of these situations that it actually deals uh, damage to your spirit. Uh, I think too that when you look at uh, this, sort of, uh, this sort of aspect, uh, the only way you can return young men, and again, I was in the infantry, and the infant is known as infantry, infant soldier, young soldier. Uh, the only way you can return them to civilian society as better citizens is to make certain you don't allow the grim aspects to basically define them. They've got to be able to do very bad things without becoming bad or evil in the process. That is a tough line, and it takes constant nurturing of the young men who oftentimes are so young, you're in a role of loco parentis. You're acting really as their parent. Now let's talk about leadership and, and the essential elements to that. Now, you, you've had a, an extraordinary career in terms of different roles. So, so first off, what, what is your philosophy of, of command, really? Well, it's a great story. The Marine Corps actually attracts certain kinds of young people from our society. So there's, there's the aspect of who joins the Marine Corps. There are many people who would never consider it. And I re understand that, respect that, and actually the Marine Corps uh, encourages people who don't think that's the right place for them not to come in. Uh, because you need people in this kind of a situation who really want to be there because they are going to the veneer of civilization. 
I'll put it this way, is going to get rubbed off them and leave their character revealed. And if they cannot keep their sense of chivalry around innocent people who are caught up on a battlefield, if they can't keep a sense of who they are, then any leadership they adopt is a mimicking of something else that's not really them. So we want to attract people who have an ethical sense, and then the very tough-minded NCOs called drill instructors are going to make Marines out of them. In that regard, uh, the Marine Corps' view of leadership is very, very simple, uh, that you have a father-son, teacher-scholar relationship. It is to be really coaching more than commanding. And how does that equate to the reality of the jobs? When I was a division commander with 25,000 sailors and Marines, <clears throat> I could probably do the commanding aspects of the job in 10 to 15 minutes a day. Their other 23 hours and 45 minutes was spent on coaching young people who came of their own free will, want to do a good job, and you're trying to set the conditions, father, son, teacher, scholar, so that they can be successful. There, there's a quote that I think I have here, if, if I can find it. You're, you're talking about leadership, and, and you, you make the point that the importance of conveying your intent, yes. which is is consistent with what you just said. So, so it's, it's almost as if uh, you need to say very little and rely a lot on this mentoring role uh, 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 that you just talked about. What I found, Harry, was that the more time I spent thinking about my intent and succinctly describing what I wanted to have happen, the less time I had to give orders and commands during the fight. They knew what to do. I remember on one occasion fighting for three days, and I don't think I gave a half a dozen orders over three days, and I had 1,250 uh, Arabs, sailors, and Marines under my command. So I think as we, as we look at how we explain our intent, that is how you unleash the initiative and aggressiveness of young Americans who want to do the right thing, they've got a good ethical sense, and you allow them to use their initiative rather than becoming some kind of Prussian, everybody has to have permission to do anything. So I'd spent a lot of time on commander's intent, and I realized as a second lieutenant that probably my men didn't lay awake all night thinking, how am I going to mess up Lieutenant Mattis's day tomorrow? They were trying to do the right thing, so my job was to make sure they knew what the right thing was to do, and then unleash them. And when they make mistakes, understand the difference between a mistake where they were trying their best with the information they had at their age, many times they're very young men, but there's a difference between a mistake and a lack of discipline. And the Marine Corps is very abrupt and account, hold people accountable for a lack of discipline. They are accountable for it. They're not victims. They will act and behave like U.S. Marines. So it was this discrimination between a mistake and a lack of discipline coupled with a sense that I owed them the best possible articulation of what my interests were, what my vision was, what my commander's intent was. So, so it sounds like the, the preparation to convey intent is, is hard work on your part. It is. Because you, you've really got to think about the words you're going to use and uh, uh, make it a learning experience for them as you yourself do this hard work. You know, Harry, I met once with uh, General Colin Powell. On, actually, on more than one occasion, he was a wonderful mentor, and if I had problems uh, bothering me, I could always call him or, when I saw him, ask for some wisdom, which he was always eager to share. Uh, and he told me that he had sat for quite some time as he thought about how he was going to explain to the American people what we were going to do about the Iraqi army in Kuwait when we attacked. And eventually he came up with the words, we are going to cut off the head and destroy it. Uh, to this day, many people remember that one sentence. He didn't spend a long time on a strategic rationale and the operational pauses that would accompany the various operational missions. He gave a very succinct description of what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Really, that's an example, obviously put in military terms, not civilian terms, for how you deal with a lot of time spent thinking about the strategic or the larger purpose, and then leave, delegate to the young people uh, the opportunities to exercise their initiative at the lowest level. 
This is fascinating because uh, in your role as a general, you have different audiences. And, and when you're head of Central Command, you, you even have uh, uh, more people who you have to talk differently mm -hmm. to. And uh, I think it's fair to say you are known for what is taken as statements. They're very outspoken. Yeah. And but but what you're suggesting here is that's a, an important element in communicating with the, the people under you, uh, and and whereas a different audience might read into what you're saying very different things. It's gotten me crosswired with people at times, but it never caused me to apologize to take it back. It, I never changed my style. Uh, when asked once, uh, where do you think you get the right to speak like that? I said, last time I checked, it was in the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights. <laughs> and I'm in the Marine Corps, but I'm not just in the Marines. I'm in the U.S. Marines, and I consider myself a U.S. citizen. Uh, obviously, I never tried to upset anyone. It wasn't my goal to do that. It was to convey a purpose. But at the same time, I never thought I had to patronize young men who were 18 and act like they couldn't understand something. And generally, I tried to speak in a way to my admirals and generals when eventually I had dozens of them under my command, the same way I spoke to the others who were more junior in rank, in experience, in age, of course. But, but it was designed for whatever audience I was speaking to, but it should resonate through all those ranks. And I had an army general when I made colonel who pulled me aside and told me something that really affected me. He said, you have always up until now as a battalion commander, company commander, platoon commander, you've been able to know your men personally. He said, you've known your sailors and Marines, you know their names, you see their walk, you can tell who they are at 50 meters away. He said, now you're going to executive leadership and your leadership is going to be filtered down through different people. He said, you're going to have to make even more clear what your intent is. You're gonna to have to go to the graduate school now for this. Otherwise, what you've done all along and were able to reinforce with your knowledge of individuals will no longer be applicable. And so I, I kind of put myself back to school and read how generals in history have conveyed their intent, admirals in history, and it was a big help. You, you have said that uh, in, in our time, uh, unfortunately, there is a separation between patriotism and liberalism, meaning a kind of an understanding of, of Western civilization. Yeah. So, so that is something you also have to convey not only to the broader public, but also to your soldiers, that, that yeah. there, there, there is a, 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 an important element uh, of knowing the tradition that they come out of that, that's broader than the military tradition. Yes. Going back to the 1960 to 1975 time frame, there was a disenchantment among many people in the country. Uh, and, you know, we ended up in Vietnam and it just tore the society apart in terms of trust of each other. Uh, John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, I'm sure, had the best of intentions, uh, Democrat presidents. Democrat Party president. Uh, when Nixon got in, he was confronted with a war that the American people had basically uh, grown very disappointed in. Uh, and the country was in the process of holding it against its military, many of whom were draftees, of holding it against the political, what they thought was the right wing. Uh, I, I think to some degree unwilling to look at the fact that it was the political left that had put us into the war. Uh, but I don't think it's ever been patched up. Now, I will tell you that among young people today, they are very non-ideological and they don't buy into it. Uh, they draw their own conclusions and they may agree or disagree with things, but it's not based on what happened in those days. I think that that divorce between liberalism and patriotism has never been patched up. But jumping forward to today, uh, I would tell you that I have Lance Corporals who can articulate the nobility of the wars we are in today better than the spokesman in Washington, D.C. The ideas that grew out of the Enlightenment, they were given voice in our country in our Declaration of Independence, our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, those are worth defending. And I've dealt with this enemy since 1979, and I don't patronize them. When they say girls don't go to school, they mean it. You're not going to have a barbecue and talk them out of their position. They didn't arrive there rationally.
They will not be rationally uh, removed from that position. Uh, when you find people who say you will pray, you will go to the, this mosque, and by the way, if you don't go to this mosque, if you go to that one, we're going to kill you. Uh, well, these are irreconcilable differences. And so somehow we have to be able to articulate this, understand this, and be able to explain the nobility of it. And I think really since Tony Blair left office as the Prime Minister in the United Kingdom, we've had no Western political leader who has been able to address in a compelling, persuasive way, for example, what FDR was able to, to convey uh, when we went into World War II. I mean, here our fleet was laying on the bottom of Pearl Harbor. Admiral Nimitz was on his way to take over a shattered military. The army would surrender in, in the Philippines. And at that point, the American people were very focused on the Japanese, and FDR said, no, we're not going after the Japanese first, we're going after Hitler first. How did he change the American people to do it? He was persuasive. He brought Frank Capra out of California, a movie director, put an army uniform on him, said, you're going to make movies that every single young American in, in basic training in the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, they're all going to watch him, and they're going to understand why we fight. We've done none of that in this, in this fight so far. So we, we've got a problem. That divorce is still real. Mostly it's with old guys. Uh, I find it's the unspoken elephant in the room with people my age who, who were able to dodge out of the draft, something like that, who still think it matters. It doesn't matter to me. I'm more interested in their views today. But to some of them, I think it does still matter. And there's a sense of their manhood is in question. I think it's a, more of a self-consciousness than anything that we feel. Another audience that you have to address is the, the, the political elite in the country, whether in the yeah. Congress uh, or in the executive branch. Talk a little about the challenges of, of doing that and uh, uh, making points like you just made. Well, you, the first point I would make is you try to avoid any adversarial relationship. I, have, I give the best military advice I can come up with. But I have to understand the president's portfolio is broader than mine. So he may or may not take it. What I expect, and, and I've never been shy with this, is that I would get a hearing. Um, I sign a lot of next to kin letters. I have sent a lot of troops into fights. And it is critical that we tell our civilian leaders what we think we can, or more importantly at times, what we cannot do with a military instrument, uh, especially as we get uh, more and more political leaders who've had no military experience. Some can have exaggerated views of what the military can do. Some can have unrealistic views in, in any number of ways. So what you do is you try to create no adversarial relationships, no antagonism, but you give blunt military advice. I expect to be heard. I don't expect to be obeyed. I wasn't elected. But at the same time, I do not mince words, and I don't I consider it part of respect for our political system. Now, will that at times cause people concern? Uh, will it get General Shinseki when he says that, he, the, that an invasion of Iraq will take hundreds of thousands more troops than, uh, than what the political uh, leadership wanted to admit to at the time? Uh, yes, and General Shinseki was marginalized as a result. Lieutenant General Newbold, the operations officer for the Joint Staff, questioned the wisdom of going into Iraq. Uh, he was supposed to be promoted to four stars. He was sent home as a three star. So are there, are there uh, institutional penalties for it? There can be, but um, I don't think those are all that injurious and you do what your duty tells you to do and you know, kind of let God sort out the rest of it. So what, what, uh, what we're talking about here is, po if you want me to do X, if you want me to attack uh, Iran, say, then these are the questions you have to ask yourself uh, in, in terms of what happens afterward. That, that's, that, that's the kind of dialogue you, you think is really important in your role. Critically important. President Emeritus Jim Wright of Dartmouth uh, has written an article in The Atlantic uh, last summer, a year ago, and he said, what did we learn from the Korean War? And really the question is, how can the country go relatively enthusiastically into wars uh, since World War II and not know how to end them? You know, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, dare I say Afghanistan. 
And Jim Wright points out that if you start with murky political end states, if the politicians have not said, this is what we want, then you're liable to find any road will get you there. And you don't know what you're doing. Pretty soon, because you're not sure what you're doing is right, you'll start cranking down very tightly on rules of engagement because you want to do it the right way, even if you're not sure if it's the right thing. And now you're into a stagnating kind of situation. The American people understandably grow uh, dismayed by the whole thing. So you must start with very clearly articulated political end states. And then you figure out what are the diplomatic and economic means, what are the information means. Radio Free Europe was very effective during the Cold War. Uh, certain you look at the CIA and the military. But you can't keep reaching for the CIA and military because they're organized for competition and just dismiss economic or uh, diplomatic or information means because they're not organized to compete in a global argument. We've got to use all those elements and use very clearly articulated political end states to ensure we don't get into these wars without end. And, and you, you've been involved in, in the last decade in, in all of these wars that we fought, and it was a real sort of learning experience. You uh, were uh, billeted back to Quantico, uh, where you helped uh, write a new counterinsurgency doctrine. Talk about that, because what, what in reading about you, what, what was quite interesting was you, you, the generals, in a way, had to learn from their soldiers about what they were experiencing and rethink the strategy and broaden the strategy. So, so it, you had to win over the people. You had to do things that were not just fighting and being a warrior. Right. You know, if you read enough history, you realize there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, that's the bottom line. But each situation is unique. History will not tell you how to do in every circumstance, but it will light the path ahead for you and say, here is how other people have dealt successfully or unsuccessfully with a similar situation. You never really know an enemy until you fight them. You can read all about them. You can get your intelligence reports. But until you close in on them, you can't really know this enemy. So as we fought the enemy, uh, for example, in Iraq, where we went in with basically a conventional force to fight a conventional army, as we shifted to counterinsurgency, we had to capture the lessons that were unique to that circumstance. Uh, because the fundamental nature of war will never change. The character of war is changing all the time, like a chameleon, as von Clausewitz puts it. So what we were trying to do is capture those lessons learned, Harry, and make certain that they were passed on in training so the troops were at the top of their game as they deployed into the combat zone. In confronting the situation in Afghanistan and Iraq, it was a learning experience for you. And uh, I have the sense that you're not a general who's back you know, uh, away from the front. Mm -hmm. So talk a little about that. I mean, you're, you're a guy who's out there with the soldiers, learning from them, you know, understanding the, the particular challenges that occur in the course of the conflict. Yeah, I mean, generalizations are never wholly accurate, but there's really two kinds of generals. One of them gets briefed by his staff about what's going on, and the other one briefs his staff what's going on. I found it much more accurate and much faster decision making in terms of the process if I would go out and spend most of my time with the lead elements and then come back and debrief my staff on what was going on. They would tell me how they read it and basically you'd use Hegel's dialectic. I'd give them a thesis, they'd give me sometimes uh, a antithesis and we'd come up with some synthesis of understanding of where we were at and what we wanted to do. Uh, I would give a fair amount of time early in a day or late at night with the staff telling them what I wanted to do. Then I would go out and wander around, basically. And the further front I got, the more I could really get a sense if the lads thought they were, they were winning, they were surging, if there were aggravations, if there were supply problems, that sort of thing. And I'd overreact right there on the spot with the authority given to, obviously, a commander to uh, to set them up for success. So really, I thought it was more important to be in that position, in that role, 
uh, I knew I had a great deal of confidence in my staff. They were all combat experienced. They knew what they were doing with some commander's intent. They knew how to keep the, the division running. Now I had to get out <clears throat> and see what was going on and give them feedback. So we didn't use command and control. We used command and feedback. I wasn't that interested in controlling my units because battlefield opportunities open and close very quickly. If they knew my intent and they were taking advantage of those opportunities, they would be feeding back to me successes they'd identified and used their aggressiveness to take advantage of uh, rather than waiting for me to say, for them to say, mother may I and that sort of thing. So out wandering around like that really unleashed a lot of combat power. Let's talk you about some of your recent battles. And uh, so you were involved in, in the first forces the, in Afghanistan mm -hmm. uh, taking Kandahar. What, what was the challenge there? And, and how did you adapt to that situation? Uh, the challenges really were twofold. One was the depth of the insertion. It was 350 nautical miles, one way by helicopter from the North Arabian Sea. Uh, it involved Marine KC-130s refueling helicopters at night uh, over mountains uh, going in. Uh, the enemy obviously greatly outnumbered us during the opening days of the fight, uh, upwards of 20,000 in Kandahar because they had fallen back in their defeats by the CIA and special forces led uh, national or uh, Northern Alliance. They'd fallen back from Mazari Sharif to Kabul to Kandahar, their spiritual home. My job was to move against Kandahar. Uh, so we knew that the distance would make it uh, a tough fight if the enemy chose to really come out strongly. Uh, they didn't. Uh, again, we didn't know them well until we fought them, but they lacked the courage to close on the sailors and Marines. Uh, the uh, ferocity and the skill of the sailors and marines was more than sufficient there. The second uh, challenge really was dealing with Pakistan. Uh, the, when the admiral uh, leaned across the table one night in Bahrain, the fleet commander, Vice Admiral Willie Moore, and said, can you get the marines from the Mediterranean and the Pacific together and move against Kandahar? Uh, I said, yep, I can do that. And he said, okay, go tell me what you need and, and go plan it and do it. Uh, he was very comfortable with that idea. He, he trusted me. We had not served together before. He was a three-star. I was a one-star. But uh, he put me in command of seven of his ships and 10,000 sailors and Marines, ultimately, and then I went uh, with the lads. Uh, there was a country, Pakistan, between the water and Afghanistan. So I went to Pakistan in a very long discussion uh, the Pakistanis agreed to give me uh, a beachhead, uh, a nearby runway uh, that I could use to offload gear from the ships and bring in C-130s and Air Force C-17s uh, to land on dirt on a dry lake bed in Afghanistan so we could build up combat power and move against Kandahar. So those were the two biggest challenges, the distance and having to deal with Pakistan. By the way, Pakistan knew H hour and D day and the objective three weeks in advance. They kept it secret. And every time I moved up towards the borders in the high country, I would fly to Islamabad first over the succeeding months, and they would move frontier wings around to help contain the enemy as we moved against them on our side of the border. So there would have been no naval ground campaign in southern Afghanistan in 2001, the closing months of 2001, 2002, without Pakistani help. In your role, you deploy diplomatic skills, it sounds like to me, so that, so that you had a problem here that is getting the, the Pakistanis on board. So you had to listen to what they said and understand their interests. I think they, they wanted you to do a lot of this at night, you said uh, earlier. So, so talk a little about that. So, so there has to be uh, a, a respect and a, a sense of the interest of people who are working with you? Well, the first point is we need officers today who are not just willing to listen to other people's ideas, but willing to be persuaded by them. And there's a world of difference between someone who says, okay, I'm going to listen to you, Harry, then I'm going to go off and do the same thing I was going to do in the first place, no matter what you say. And those who are willing to say, I'm willing to listen to you, and if you have a better idea, then I'll do what you recommend. In Pakistan's case, uh, when I first got there in landed in Islamabad, uh, I had a great little map 
and it showed what I was going to do, showed a little ship out in the ocean and an arrow going to Afghanistan and this sort of thing. And I walked in to see our ambassador there. I'd landed at midnight, walked into her office about 8 o'clock in the morning, and she said, who the hell are you and what are you doing in my country? Uh, and I thought, well, this isn't going to go so well. So I said, well, Madam Ambassador, my name is Jim Mattis. I'm going to take about a thousand of my best friends up in Afghanistan and kill some people. And she said, really, General? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, well, sit down. I think I can help you. And she opened every door at the Pakistan Joint Headquarters of their military. I went over to see them, and the Pakistanis, it, was, uh, it went from a very cordial call uh, like a regimental tea in the finest British officers' mess tradition. And many of them saying, my best uh, year of my life was a year spent at Fort Leavenworth uh, training with your army or a year at Maxwell Air Force Base learning with your Air Force. Uh, but up against the wall were a bunch of young officers, and if looks could kill, it was clear that they didn't care for me. Uh, an amendment called the Pressler Amendment had gone into effect and said that those officers could never come to America for training. Uh, so we had cut them off. We were angry at them uh, for policy reasons. And instead of continuing to work with them, we had cut them off. And now here I was needing their help and their freedom to operate over their country. Uh, they noted they started with Francis Gary Powers being shot down uh, <laughs> some years ago. I was not yet in my teens. Uh, we were never to reveal the base he flew out of to the, to the world, to the Russians. He'd flown out of Pakistan, of course, to take his U-2 over the top of Russia. Uh, they talked about, and they went on for years, about disappointments with us, including that they had bought F-16s from us, and then we had parked them in Arizona in hangars, refused to give them their money back, refused to send them the airplanes, but we did send them a bill every month for rental on the hangars. And finally, I said, you know, I'm not a politician. I'm going to Afghanistan. I'm going to fly over one or two countries, and will you help me? And then they gave us all the help in the world. I think it's important that you be willing to walk in another man's shoes and listen to them and understand they may have legitimate reasons to be disappointed with us. Even Winston Churchill, who had a bit of love for Americans, said you can trust the Americans after they've exhausted all possible alternatives to do the right thing. We frustrate a lot of people in the world, and it's often we're most peevish with our friends. It's like we deal more rationally at times with our enemies and adversaries, and we treat our friends in a very uh, derogatory way and often in a publicly humiliating manner. And I think that is very unproductive, and I, I never apologize for American foreign policy, but I do try to understand other people's points of view. Uh, let, let's look at, at Iraq for a moment and, and talk a little about Fallujah, because that, those battles, the, the taking of the place, then the, the retaking of it, and ultimately the, the, the loss of it to al-Qaeda, uh, uh, that was an experience in which your adversary was really changing. Was it not? I mean, in other words, it was more of an indigenous force that you were dealing with uh, that had emerged after the overthrow of the regular army. Talk a little about that. Is that a, is that a fair assessment? I, I think that is fair. Uh, what had happened was al Qaeda was now moving in in strength and the Sunni tribes very disillusioned since the Sunni minority had dominated Iraq and the Shia majority. Uh, they, they were very disappointed. Uh, when Saddam was overthrown. But as we came in to relieve the 82nd Airborne Division, we we just left some units as recently as September, and by January we were already shipping our gear back on board ship, and some of us were reporting in to go back into the fight. During that interim, uh, it had turned from an area down south where I'd only lost two men killed and about 50 wounded over five months, and I think that was mostly criminal elements, into a full-fledged insurgency out in the, in the Sunni Triangle. So we had a view towards how we could turn them around. Uh, Brigadier General John Kelly, my assistant division commander, had gone in. He was convinced we could turn the Sunni tribes against al-Qaeda. Uh, frankly, we didn't think it'd take us five years to do it, but we, we had a vision of where we wanted to go. In this case, in Fallujah, uh, some contractors uh, lost on the battlefield, not checking in with the Marines, took a direct route from Baghdad to another city that took them through Fallujah, 
a very unwise move. They were captured, killed, uh, they were bodies were burned, and they were strung up on a bridge. Uh, both General Conway, my corps level commander, my Marine Expeditionary Force commander, Lieutenant General, and I strongly recommended we not attack the city. It was a city of 350,000 people. It, uh, I did not have many troops I could throw at it because we were holding a very wide area and the enemy was rising all across that zone. So when, uh, when we were finally ordered to go in, uh, it was uh, something that we had to scramble to bring in assault battalions to do. We hadn't isolated the city, and it was a tough fight. It was a very tough fight. When they ordered us to stop in place, uh, we were probably within 48 to 96 hours of crushing the enemy at this point. We'd contained them in a small area, and they had not stockpiled enough ammunition, and now we were, it was becoming a very uh, lucrative fight for us in terms of the enemy paying a price. Uh, at that point, uh, for political reasons, we were stopped. I was ordered to start negotiating uh, with the enemy. <clears throat> we did so, and after 70-odd days, and we pulled back. It was probably best summed up, though, in terms of the impact on the Marines <clears throat> with a young man who was interviewed on TV, uh, blonde-haired, very young, dirty machine gunner, and they said, isn't this terrible? You've lost your buddies. You're now being ordered to pull back. Don't you feel terrible? This must be terrible. You must be terribly angry at the political leadership. And he was a slow-talking boy from down south. And <clears throat> he said, no. He said, uh, we'll just find him somewhere else and kill him. Uh, so the Marines did not suffer the loss of morale that would have concerned me greatly. And it, it's a testimonial to their fighting faith because I was very concerned at this point. Uh, but they, they did not take it badly. Uh, then eventually I'd rotated out and we went in and we lost uh, hundreds of soldiers, sailors, Marines in actually taking the city. Uh, I went into the city a few years later. I didn't have to wear a helmet or flak jacket. Obviously it turned around. And then since the American troops were pulled out uh, by the administration, the, uh, the Maliki government uh, has not endeared itself to the Sunni tribes again. So I don't think the city's fallen to Al-Qaeda. Certainly the Sunni tribes do not want the Iraqi army. They see it as the Shia army in their town. Fallujah has always been a rather, uh, a rather tough town uh, throughout history. Uh, but at the same time, I wouldn't say Al-Qaeda holds the town because Al-Qaeda and the Sunni tribes do not have a long love affair. Uh, it, they don't care for each other. So we'll just have to see how it, how it evolves and see if Maliki can make it an inclusive government that brings the Sunnis back in with a sense of uh, ownership of the government. Right now, we have not seen that. In, in your description of uh, your, your core and <clears throat> of the sense of duty and responsibility, uh, what sort of problem is posed by the frustration of leaving uh, Iraq completely. I mean, is it is it something because of the training and and the, the focus on the job and the responsibility to civilian leadership that that it's it's not as much of a problem. It can be transcended the the frustration of after all of these battles, le having to leave uh, Iraq and and not being able to do the mentoring that was really necessary for the Iraqi forces. Yeah, the Iraqi forces were, were very uh, immature still. I mean, they'd been put together in the midst of a murderous war. Uh, they hadn't had time to grow the institutions. Uh, certainly there was the ethical consideration that we were not there on the scene to guide them and make certain that the weapons we had given them, the training we'd given them, were not used for unethical reasons in a region that is just fraught with, with uh, polarities, tribal, religious, this sort of thing. So certainly we felt an ethical, a moral responsibility that we stay there. But also, if you look at World War II, certainly we brought most of our troops home from Japan and Germany when w the war was over, but we didn't bring them all home. We weren't willing to say we're going to spend that amount of life and treasure and then just turn around and walk away. Uh, and by 1948, of course, we're building up NATO uh, because of the uh, the Iron Curtain and the Soviet Union. 
and the troops in Japan a couple years later would be deployed to Korea to fight against the, the communist advance there. And so there was, there's also a sense of don't snatch defeat out of the jaws of victory. Uh, it was a victory. The Iraqi people had a chance to make it happen. Plus there was the sense that with the Americans there, it was harder to deal harshly with the Kurdish or with the Sunni minorities. They're just, America is a pluralistic society and we don't think if one side wins an election that the other side simply has no rights. So there was a sense that we could help cement the, the kind of the fruits of the victory we'd achieved, the military victory. It was not a total victory. So that's kind of where we were coming from and why we recommended that we keep troops there. The political decision uh, by President Obama was we would not keep troops there. You uh, have a quote that I found, which is, in this age, I don't care how tactically or operationally brilliant you are, if you cannot create harmony, even vicious harmony, on the battlefield based on trust across service lines, across coalition and national lines, and across civilian military lines, you need to go home because your leadership is obsolete. We have got to have officers who can create harmony across all lines. I'm very interested in this across coalition and national lines, because as military budgets are reduced, yeah. in the future, we're gonna to have to be able to do that. Uh, you're 100% correct. Further, I have never fought in an all-American formation. I have always had uh, allies, many of whom didn't even speak English, uh, right beside us, fighting alongside us. <clears throat> and we have got to have the ability to see what they can do. We can't say, well, they don't have radios as good as ours, or they don't have jets as good as ours. There's plenty of room for everyone. My headquarters in Iraq, my division headquarters, was guarded by Tongan Marines from the little island nation of Tonga in the Pacific. And I asked them, what are you doing here? Why are you in Iraq? And they said, we have an international responsibility to stand with the Americans when they do something like this because they've always stood with us. Friends need tending, but you can have the best of intentions break down on a battlefield if you don't have officers who are willing to listen to others and use them in a manner that they can be best used. Uh, I, would, I would just tell you too that uh, Winston Churchill again has said the only thing more difficult than fighting with allies is fighting without allies. It is, it is harder. Uh, but there are ways where you lay out missions and allow their commanders to select which missions they can do. That to me is a normal part of coalition warfare. Their countries take ownership of their forces. They're not giving them to the Americans to be used any way we wish. There are some caveats is what we call it, national caveats. I've never found those to be a bar to imaginative use of their forces still consistent with their political master's intent. So you've got to have this as the bottom line. And as we shrink the US military, you're exactly right. This is going to be more important than ever. And if we can't do it well in our military, then even political alliances and coalitions will not make up for a brittleness on the battlefield. And yes, it's harmony. It's, it, operations today move at the speed of trust. That's the bottom line. And that creates this harmony that we need. We're confronting a world with uh, unbelievable problems. I mean, you just tick off a couple, Syria, uh, uh, Iran, what do we do about their nuclear program? Uh, we have uh, allies that sometimes don't always cooperate in terms of our national interests, say the, uh, uh, the Israel-Palestine conflict and, and searching for a resolution there. <clears throat> I guess what I want to ask you as a, as a kind of an outspoken general on the one hand, but a very thoughtful uh, general who who is both a, a theorist and a practitioner. That's what I'll, I'll label. I'll give you. How do you see the military contributing to this dialogue on the? They're very different issues. Mm -hmm. I understand that. But but uh, the the military has ideas to bring to the table. Mm -hmm. Uh, talk about how you see that yeah. playing out with, without necessarily getting into great detail about any of these problems. Yeah. Let me talk about the themes I would adopt. Uh, if we don't fully fund State Department, 
uh, I used to tell people on Capitol Hill, then please buy more ammunition for me because I'm going to get in more fights. So the first point is to make certain that we're not always reaching for the military or CIA when there's a problem. Let's make certain the traditional rules, the traditional roles of statecraft uh, are used as well. Uh, diplomacy, economic means, uh, coalition building, that sort of thing. Uh, now certainly if, if I were to sum up some of my missions in the Middle East, one was to make certain that the uh, free shipping lanes, the, the shipping lanes were kept free for commerce and oil and all uh, to move through, to stand by our allies when they were up against terrorists, you know, that sort of thing. But the real mission I had was to try to keep what passes for peace in the Middle East, which it granted Syria and Iran and everything else, but try to keep the peace or what passes for peace for one more year, one more month, one more week, one more day, one more hour to allow the Secretary of State and the other political efforts to try to solve these maddening problems. And you're right, we're in a, we're in a world awash with change and transitions and, and wars and, and the rest. So the military often is the tool that buys the time. It doesn't solve many of the problems. It can solve some problems. People who say war never solved anything haven't read our history. It solved slavery once and for all in this country. It solved uh, putting Jews in ovens once and for all by Hitler. So the military can solve something, but it's a pretty brittle instrument. So in the, especially in these wars among the people, we need to create more and more coalitions. We need to look at other ways to compete, not just military and CIA, and make certain we're using the traditional tools of statecraft. Uh, that the approach has got to be one of coalition building, of treating our friends well, and being willing to side with non-traditional allies, security allies, even when we don't agree with everything they do inside their country. FDR was a pretty progressive president, but he was willing to side with Stalin to defeat Hitler. I would think that we can also side with countries that are not perfect. We sometimes expect perfection from other countries that we don't expect from our own. And so we make these coalitions, and the military's role is to buy time which allows for traditional statecraft to solve the problems. And, and in the case of uh, World War II, it was the American military that could defeat Hitler and, and stop what was going on, mm -hmm. you know, in the camps. Uh, uh, I guess that w what I hear you saying, and, and, and actually there's an example that I heard you talk about. So the, the military can also be used to uh, Sort of diminish the the, uh, the the rush toward war. There is the case of the Iranians threatening to close the Persian yeah. Gulf. Talk a little about that because you used your military and you you found a coalition there yeah. in doing that. Well, and and one point I would make is uh, you when the enemy's digging a hole, don't stop them. Let them continue to dig themselves into the hole. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, as you'll recall from a couple years ago, Harry. The, uh, out of Tehran, they were constantly talking about their ability to mine the Straits of Hormuz, to stop the flow of oil. And of course, it sent shudders through the world economy repeatedly. Uh, and countries from all around the world that rely on that oil, not so much the Americans, by the way, were very worried. But only the American Fifth Fleet was trusted by everyone out there to be the coalescing force. So as this was going on, I was growing increasingly concerned that because of all this political talk out of Tehran, some young zealot of a commander in the Iranian Republican Guard Navy would take it on himself to dump mines there, or they would actually make the political decision in Tehran. And I tried to think of how do we prevent this. So we came up with the idea of having the U.S. Fifth Fleet lead an international anti-mine coalition, not an anti-Iran coalition, anti-mine. Now, there's only one country over there that's ever threatened to use mines, but we were silent on that. We put the word out, and I assumed we would get maybe a half a dozen nations, you know, France, Britain, United Arab Emirates, kind of our usual uh, friends and allies. In fact, the first time we ran it, 29 nations showed up. It included Canada, Estonia, Singapore, Djibouti, Japan. These are not bellicose nations, 29 nations. They showed up the next year, by the way, there was 35 nations. 
And under U.S. Fifth Fleet, they all came together. They discussed what they would do if there were mines put in the water. We then tested new technologies from the United Kingdom. Uh, we had divers from Djibouti underwater looking for mines and how they would go about clearing the straits. And when we were done, and, and we put it out on the press, we didn't hide it one bit, what we were doing. When we were done, we had convinced the Iranians to tone down their rhetoric, to stop talking about it. You've heard very little about this over the last two years now, because they realized they were actually creating a worldwide coalition against them. And by doing this, we reduced the chance for a mistake, a miscalculation, and at that point, we were buying time for then Secretary Clinton to continue to amass the economic sanctions against Iran and try to tone it down, use non-military means to try to solve this problem, since another war in the Middle East would be catastrophic. So that's an example of how the U.S. military, the only one who could have brought that many disparate nations together and buy time for the diplomats to do their, do their magic, frankly. One last question. <clears throat> Students watching uh, this program, what advice uh, you uh, would give them about uh, preparing for a future in the military? And, and I, as a, a little note here, I want to uh, add a quote from you which, where you say, now from a distance I look back on what the Corps taught me, to think like men of action and to act like men of thought to live life with intensity and a passion for excellence. Mm -hmm. how, how does that translate into preparations that students might think about for the future in the military? There is, there is a disappointing aspect to all this, that after thousands of years of living on this planet, we're still at a point where violence is used to settle differences. Uh, and it can be depressing for those young uh, men and women who are choosing to go into the military. The, the point I would make is that no matter how bad any situation is, do not fall into pessimism or defeatism or cynicism, because all cynicism is, is a refuge that says, I don't have to do anything about this because after all, uh, it's such a bad situation, I exempt myself from having to work on it. So the first point is guard yourself and don't let the disappointment drive you to a, to a negative view of the world. The second point is remember that America has the power of inspiration and the power of intimidation. And don't shortchange either, either one of those. Make certain that at times, if you can use the power of inspiration to bring out the better angels in people, keep trying one more month, one more week, one more day to do so, whether it be with a small village that's trying to fight terrorists or it's a, it's a high-level meeting. But at the same time, uh, if you have covenants without swords, if you have no effective military, then your moral voice will never be heard as loudly. And uh, dare I say that we just saw what Putin did in Crimea, and it may be that he thought he had an opportunity there that we've not demonstrated a steadfast, uh, basically, that we're sticking with our allies. So I think you've got to recognize in the real world a combination of between the ability to inspire and the ability to intimidate, and don't overuse one or the other, a blend of them. That would be my advice to them. Uh, Jim, uh, I want to thank you for coming to the campus to be the Nimitz Lecturer, and, and thank you for taking the time in your schedule to be uh, uh, on our program. It was both informative uh, and inspiring. Thank oh, you. Thank you. This is a pleasure, Harry. This is, some things are work and some are a pleasure. This is a pleasure. Thank you very much. And thank you for joining us for this conversation with history.